Chapters nine and ten of the Cross Brand by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nine. If there were men about the place, that woman's scream would bring them out with guns in their hands. Jack Bristol paused to ask no questions. He flung himself back into the saddle on the mare and put her over the first fence and then cantered across the meadow beyond in the meantime the little house behind him which he had been watching over his shoulder fairly boiled with life lights stirred across the windows three or four men ran out slamming doors and shouting to one another a lantern went swinging toward the barn then someone sighted the fugitive there was no preliminary warning no call to him to stop but a rifle began crackling at once in the hands of an expert for only an expert shooting at such a distance and moving target by such a light could have put his bullets so close to the mark a word to susan sent her on a redoubled speed and out of all danger almost at once but as she leaped the fence into the open road jack heard the quick rattling of hoofbeats across a wooden culvert far behind and knew that the armed men of that household were out upon his trail and out for blood not until this moment did he have an opportunity to think but he could come to no conclusion all that he knew was that the girl had seen the gleaming scar on his forehead and after that she had fled with a shriek as though from a wild beast but what did that cross represent why had it been placed upon the faces of hank sherry and his son charlie who had placed it there a horrible explanation began to form dimly in the back of his brain but before it became a real conclusion the remembered shriek of the girl ran back across his mind and blotted out the rest in the meantime they could never catch brown susan the run from the upper mountains had apparently merely served to loosen her muscles the pause while the master talked to the girl had completely rested the mare again and now she was as full of running as ever so jack let her drop back until the pursuers were fairly close the wind had scoured the sky clean of all clouds by this time and in the faint light of the sickle moon he saw the blotchy shapes of the riders bobbing up and down as they spurred in pursuit now and again they loosed a scattered volley at him in the chance of striking the man or the horse with a random shot but all those bullets flew wild and jack laughed at their efforts he would win one small revenge out of this night's nice work he decided he would lead them at his heels until dawn making them think every moment that they were about to run him down and at the end of that time he would simply canter away from them as though on the wings of the wind indeed the horses behind were laboring at full speed while susan keeping up her long striding gallop was holding them even without an effort two miles three miles flew beneath her and jack was forced to rein her in as the pace told on the riders behind he saw a fork in the road before him now and was about to take the branch to the left because it promised to lead out of the valley and into the higher ground beyond when he saw by the growing moonlight a sweep of a dozen horsemen coming far off down that road with an oath he swung susan on to the other road but how had they been able to spread the alarm he looked up and he saw the moonlight running in a cluster of straight horizontal lines above him telephone wires of course what a consummate fool he had been he had thought to play tag with them and they in the meantime were throwing a circle of danger around him while the men rode at his heels the girl stayed at the telephone spreading the alarm jack bristol looked away at the tall mountains to the left from which he had been shut off then he loosed the reins and susan bounded away but a wild yelling began the instant he turned on to that right fork and the yelling was echoed from squarely in front of him yes down the road before him swung a new body of horsemen small with distance but riding hard they had blocked him on every road but he turned susan to the right and sent her sailing over the fence into the open field beyond what difference did it make to her whether she ran on smooth roads or rough fields she flew like a swallow dipping up and down with her long leaps and crossed the wide field sailed the next fence again and struck in new-ploughed ground beyond 
jack with an exclamation of dismay felt her flounder into a laboring trot through the muck and leaning to the side he peered ahead to make out how far the field extended the moon haze was thick before him but in the little distance he could make out the outlines of a fence toward this then he pressed on and glancing back over his shoulder he saw the posses tearing across the field in pursuit and gaining now at a fearful rate well let them run as they pleased when they reached the ploughed ground it would stop them more effectually than a wall of stone brown susan stepping more than fetlock deep struggled on toward the fence stepped on to a strip of firmer ground just behind it leaped the obstacle like a cat and landed on deeper and newer ploughed ground just beyond that was the meaning then of the triumphant shouting behind him and to the sides they understood that he had run into a trap from which there was no exit no he was helpless for looking to the side he saw a group of riders spurring down some undiscovered lane to skirt around and gain the front of him there hemmed in on all sides they would shoot him to death from a safe distance already they were opening fire the rifle bullets began to sing their short weird lyrics in his ears another moment and gallant sue would be struck so jack sprang to the top of the fence so that his body would be clearly outlined and threw up his hands the firing ceased almost at once men began to run across the ploughed area towards him and susan knowing well enough that they had been in flight from just those people crowded close and whinnied softly and anxiously to call him away they came around him with a rush they came silently like wolves that are wild with starvation and literally they leaped at his throat men sprang from either side he was smashed to the ground his revolver was torn from him his arms were bound behind his back then he was dragged to his feet again he found a crowd of more than thirty angry faces around him all dimly and ominously outlined in the moonlight out of the jargon of many fierce voices speaking at the same time came a call for silence it's captain carney said some of those nearest let's hear what he has to say we'll get a light first said the heavy voice which had been calling for silence we'll get a light and see that nell wasn't looking at a ghost that didn't exist girls are tolerable skittish and they see double when they get excited but if it should turn out to be what she said we ain't going to act hasty boys are we we'll talk it over plum quiet cap answered the other so captain carney scratched a match whose first light showed jack the face of a middle-aged man a stern face but the face of a just man withal next that light was cupped in the shielding hands of the captain and when the flame had flared out to the full the hands opened and a yellow burst of light fell on jack it brought a shout from the crowd it's him i seen it clear as day there's an oak yonder and i got a rope that ain't working let's finish him right here and now cap men from the rear began crowding in hands reached for jack but the father of nell struck those hands away boys he said ye ain't here to butcher a maverick this here is a man the same as you and me that's wrong as hell thundered someone he's a coyote done up in a man's hide that exclamation brought a growl from the others that's a true word no use wasting words over him cap shoot the dog and leave him lie jack twisted himself away from restraining hands he pressed close to Carney. Captain, he shouted through the rising clamor, for God's sake, give me half a chance. I'm not the man you think. Let me have five minutes to prove it. Captain Carney dropped a reassuring hand upon his shoulder. You're going to have a chance to talk, he said. Don't worry about that. Boys, stand off, will you? Give him a chance to say what he's got to say. Give him five minutes, boys. His huge voice cleared a circle. The others pressed back and waited now speak up sherry said captain carney boil it down and make your yarn short and leave out all the lies you can we know that you're talking for your life and that may make you want to string out the story but make it short or we'll have to interrupt you and if we interrupt you there won't be no chance of you speaking again boys said jack i'll tell you the straight of things just the way they happened I was coming over the mountains a few weeks back, and I hid on a house in the evening just when it began to get dark. Seemed natural to ask for a chuck and a place to sleep there. I done just that, and a gent with a hook nose and reddish-looking eyes let me in. 
that night while i was asleep they decided to murder me but when they tackled me i managed to fight back i killed hank sherry's son charlie with his own gun but then hank knocked me out he knocked me stiff tied me up and then heated a poker red hot and burned this cross into my forehead after that he kept me up there for weeks it was only this morning that he turned me loose and when i came down here on my way out of this country the things began to happen that you know about and that's the truth so help me god he paused and there was a heavy silence over the listeners the vigor of his speech had won him some belief why he done it said jack why he didn't kill me to get even for the killing of charlie i dunno maybe you folks can figure it out for a gent that has this scar on his forehead seems to be worse'n a ghost to the rest of you a muttering assent reached his ears susan who had been kept away by the jostling circle of men now found a way to break through and came to him snorting captain carney picked upon that incident look at that boys he said i guess a gent that has a hoss trained like that ain't all snake i say we're going to listen to some more that this gent has to say you say you ain't charlie sherry i'm not what might your name be then jack bristol and where might you come from jack from down arizona way the hell you say all that way's up to here that's the straight of it carney how come you to make a trip as long as that just started out to see a piece of the country jack paused to consider fact is he admitted at length that i got into a scrape down yonder i had to get out and get out quick and the best way for me was to get as far away as i could so i started north and never stopped until old hank sherry got his paws on me that sounds like queer talk to me said carney but it sounds like the sort of talk that a gent wouldn't make up in a minute what do you say boys ain't there a sound of truth in what he says a dubious but growing chorus of assent answered him then a big man appeared from the background and shouldered his way to the front boys said the voice of lee jarvis you've been hearing a good deal of strange talk if you let me ask this fellow a few questions i'll guarantee that i'll show you his guilt will you let me ask them ten it's lee jarvis said captain carney ingratiatingly i guess we can listen to oliver jarvis's son boys step up and talk to him jarvis thank you captain said the other and came into the little circle which was now occupied by brown susan jack and the captain in the first place he began i don't mind telling you why i'm interested this infernal blackguard rode up behind me held me up took my wallet and then struck me in the face with his revolver and knocked me senseless then he went on and met nell carney and told her that he was a messenger from me by god cried jack that's the grandfather of all the lies that were ever told i've got proof to show you said lee jarvis and he calmly lighted a match and held it cup so that the light would fall upon his face it showed to jack the complete story of the work which he had done with his fists and he found that story to be far more extensive than he had imagined the mouth of jarvis was puffed and bloody a purple bruise decorated his chin there was a red gash under one eye and the other was nearly closed by a discolored swelling moreover his face his hair and his clothes were covered with unbrushed dust a murmur ran through the crowd at the sight does it look as though one blow had done all that asked jack of the crowd tell em the truth jarvis that we stood up and fought a square fight till you went down you lion rascal said the bigger man though he kept his voice admirably under control you know that i fell head foremost from my saddle and struck on rocks by the road but we'll put that to one side what was in his mind about nell carney god alone knows she's safe at home how she got there we'll find out later on the quiet and assured manner in which lee jarvis uttered his misstatements staggered even jack and it was plain that they made a great impression upon the others now went on lee jarvis we'll ask you a few simple questions in the first place what was the crime on account of which you were forced to run for your life from arizona there's nothing i've done there which has anything to do with what i have done here answer me yes or no exclaimed jarvis did you or did you not kill a man in arizona before you started north the picture of harry ganton lying on the floor of his house flashed back upon the mind of jack i'll not answer that he said 
you're doing yourself a harm said captain carney sternly if you could have actually established that you were in arizona of course it would have proved that you are not charlie sherry you understand that to be hanged for the murder of sheriff ganton or to be lynched by a mob here what difference was there between those fates jack shrugged his shoulders let's go back said lee jarvis to the yarn which he has just told he planted himself squarely before jack his hands dropped upon his hips when you saw the cross on the forehead of the old man he asked of course you asked what it meant i did not said jack and i still don't know what it means shall i tell him then said lee jarvis shall i let him in on the secret go ahead said carney well charlie sherry said jarvis we understand that you know it well enough but i'll tell it to you over again it goes back to a time when your father was living in this valley and when you were a little shaver you and your three brothers hank sherry was always the black sheep of the community the sherry family as a matter of fact had always been the black sheep they'd raised hell in one way or another for a couple of generations if there was ever a theft or a horse stealing or a murder in the community it was always safe to hunt up the sherrys in the first place because the crime was nearly always traced back to one of them finally the crowning horror came fire broke out in the house of the minister one night everyone in the valley knew the minister he'd put his shoulder under every man's troubles at one time or another he had slaved up and down the length of the valley for thirty years doing good he'd married a girl in the valley he'd raised a family of three children late in life fire as i say broke out in the minister's house it began with the explosion of a revolver when the neighbors ran out into the street they found the minister shouting stop thief and pointing down the street and crying that oscar sherry had robbed his house but the crowd could not chase your uncle they had work closer at hand in his flight to distract the attention of the minister the thief had thrown a burning lamp upon the floor of the house the oil washed the fire across the floor instantly the lower part of the house was on fire it was an old house the fire spread wonderfully fast when the minister turned to go back into his house after he had chased the thief out his way up the stairs was blocked with the flames and his wife and three children were cut off from help above i remember that night and the crowd in the street and the way the men fought the fire and tried to get through to the family a groan arose from the crowd they pressed a little closer there were older men in that assemblage who had actually fought the flames on that night but they couldn't keep the fire down with their bucket lines went on lee jarvis and finally one of the children began screaming upstairs and the minister couldn't stand it he ran through the flames and got upstairs and that was the last of him a minute later the upper floor caved in the walls of the house held in a furnace and the minister's family perished in it five of them died there charlie sherry in the pause jack heard the heavy breathing of the men who surrounded him afterward went on lee jarvis they hunted down the sherry's as usual and they found the plunder from the minister's house in the home of oscar sherry that was enough oscar sherry was lynched and hung to the highest tree in the village he died cursing the rest of the world and after his death the men of the valley decided that something had to be done to get rid of the curse of the sherry family and they decided to send them out of the valley hank sherry and his four sons and mark them all so that they could never come back without being known it was a stern thing to do but five deaths had just been laid to the door of the sherry family and there were other murders a long list of em stretching back over the years so a band of masked men took your father and the four of you think back to that night charlie and they branded a cross on the forehead of each of you and then sent you out of the valley with a warning that if any one of you ever came back again he'd be killed and they did come back five years ago a horse thief was caught at lower falls there was a cross branded on his forehead on him were found the wallet and the watch of a man who had been murdered on the road three days before the thief and the murderer admitted he was mike sherry the oldest of your brothers 
six months later there was a highway robbery the robber was run down by a posse he killed tom evans before he was captured and when he was caught the posse found a cross on his forehead and he gave his name as gus sherry the next was only ten months ago judge sherry came down into the valley and tackled hal sewell but hal was lucky with his gun and dropped the murderer in his tracks last of all here you come charlie the smoothest liar of the lot all of your brothers have shown the same poison in their blood they've all been raised like you to hate the rest of the world and we caught them all in murders or on the edge of murders and we finished every one of them just as we're going to finish you charlie sherry boys am i right right they answered one voice opposed not right enough to suit me said captain carney i've got to hear more than that you framed up an ugly story jarvis but where's the facts facts said jarvis fiercely what he did to me is one fact not a doubt in the world that he thought i was dead and that he left me for that reason search him for the wallet said the captain that will be proof enough matches were lighted busy hands probed the pockets of jack's coat and here cried one here it is before the amazed eyes of jack was exposed a thin wallet which had been drawn from his pocket the leather case was opened a thin sheaf of bills was exposed all twenties and bigger said captain carney not a bad haul for him at that is that proof enough now asked lee jarvis hang him send him to hell and be done with him was the loudly voiced consensus of opinion but captain carney still held them back with the weight of his single opinion as a strong and honest man can often do even with thousands all around jack bristol they swayed and stirred but carney was steady as a rock wait a minute he commanded this shows that he robbed you that's the sort of thing that a sherry might do but it ain't proof that he is a sherry captain exclaimed lee jarvis you're arguing flatly on his side i've proved the robbery and now you see the scar it's simply blind obstinacy to doubt any longer he added i'll show you one thing more he lighted another match and held it so that the light gleamed in the eyes of jack look at that scar does it seem like a new one it's an old white scar carney if that wound got good care it might look like that inside of a few weeks there's no proof in what you say now jarvis no proof in any one thing i've said but there's a lot of proof when the entire number are strung together what speaks up for him two things said carney the first is that he keeps silent that's a good thing no whining no begging no matter what else he may be he's a man jarvis he waited a moment for that point to sink home the second thing is why did he ride home with nell i only had ten seconds to hear her yarn but from what she said i gathered that he talked like a decent fellow how do you explain that jarvis leave it to a vote of the crowd suggested jarvis the malignance of the man astonished jack though the explanation could be found in his desire to get rid of a man who had beaten and shamed him i've got one thing to say said jack at length before the roar of the crowd had begun calling for the end of him take a guard and bring me up to face hank sherry if he calls me his son that'll settle it is that fair a fifteen-mile ride through the hills to prove a thing we already know stormed lee jarvis why should we do that because there's a man's life balanced in this answered carney and that's the thing that we're going to do i'll ride in the morning jarvis i'll count on having you along pat steve joe will you ride up with us he carried them before him the objections of lee jarvis were overruled in five minutes the posse which was to ride in the morning was formed and it was agreed who should guard the prisoner during that night End of chapter ten chapters eleven and twelve of the cross brand by max brand this librivox recording is in the public domain eleven in the first cold gray of the morning they came to jack bristol in the cellar room of the carney house where he was being guarded a cup of black coffee and a piece of bread with a couple of slices of bacon on top made the breakfast and a little later they started up the valley with brown susan dancing gaily on the way while her rider was held in the noose of a lariat which was twisted around the horn of carney's saddle 
jack looked back at the house and he saw in a window which opened just above the roof of the veranda the face of nell kearney watching him depart with a strained expression of loathing and terror his hands were lashed together but he raised them both and lifted his sombrero to her she disappeared to the side at once and jack as he settled the hat back on his head with a grim smile saw kearney himself eyeing him with a measure of grim interest but not a word was spoken it was plain however that whatever nell had told her father she had not completely prejudiced him against her escort of the night before for all during the ride captain kearney rode near the prisoner it was at his suggestion that the rope was removed from jack and attached merely to the neck of susan and above all something in his manner was a steady assurance to jack that in a pinch there was one man in the posse who would see that some measure of justice was meted out to the captive as for the others in the group riding before and behind jack they maintained a resolute silence so far as the man they guarded was concerned they avoided even looking at him as though they feared that if they met his glance they would have to recognize him as a human being worthy of mercy at least so grim was their mood that even when they spoke to one another it was in lowered voices so they worked their way quickly out of the valley before the morning fires began smoking in the chimneys they passed they were entering the hills before looking back jack saw a dozen ghostly and wavering fingers of smoke rising the valley was still half lost in dimness but the crests above them were already brightening with the sun the sun itself came gleaming over an eastern mountain as the posse rode into view of the sherry cabin they heard him before they saw him an axe was swinging lustily somewhere below them where the roof of the cabin was visible and with every blow the thin and tempered steel rang loudly captain kearney bent his head to one side and listened with a critical air that's a good axe man he said he's sinking her up to the wood every wallop pretty near that's old hank sherry himself i should say he was always fast with an axe jack bristol fresh from the land where wood is dug up rather than chopped down listened to the opinion with wonder and now they heard a crackling and rustling among the trees near the cabin next with a rush like a great wind down rushed a huge pine and fell crashing and splintered the steep hills caught up the echoes and sent them flying off into faint distances then the riders came into view of the woodsman it was hank sherry of course he leaned upon his axe and wiping the sweat from his forehead looked down upon the white stump glistening with the chisel strokes of the axe and bristling in the centre with a tuft of splintered wood but at sight of the approaching procession he tossed the axe far to one side and ran upon them with a cry of agony he ran straight to jack and though one or two of the riders laid hands upon guns they offered no resistance the odds were too safe upon their side charlie cried the old villain taking hold of jack's imprisoned hands oh god almighty i knew it would come out like this you shouldn't have gone down into the valley i begged you and i prayed you not to go i knew they'd get you there's a curse on us down yonder and now they brought you up here to hang you before my eyes he bowed his head into his hands and rested his forehead against the neck of susan and the bright-eyed mare turned and sniffed kindly at his shoulder as for jack he was utterly stunned only dimly his mind began to grope towards an understanding of the mountaineer if indeed hank sherry had schemed so elaborately simply to have the slayer of his son hung by the citizens of the valley and now lee jarvis who had kept carefully in the background and offered not a single opinion during the journey pressed forward in the morning light all the bruises of the battle of the night before showed plainly one eye was half shut and the other swollen giving a strangely sleepy cast to his expression that sleepiness was belied by the timbre of his voice it was plain to jack that shame and rage had worked together in jarvis until he was in a murderous passion with all due respect to you captain he said to kearney i imagine that this proves what i've been arguing about yonder is a tree with a conveniently horizontal branch we have half a dozen ropes with us why not finish the business at once 
i suppose there is no more argument about whether or not he's the son of hank sherry carney said jack so help me god you're doing a murder if you let this go through i'm not charlie sherry he was a bigger man by two inches i haven't had a chance to shave this beard has grown out and made me look more like him my hair and eyes are black like his what this hound sherry has been driving at i don't know but part of it seems to me that he wants to get me hung as his son get him hung exclaimed hank sherry stepping back and looking wildly around at the posse gents give me a chance to buy him no matter what he's stolen i'll try to pay for it or if he's hurt somebody then take me instead of him gents he's all that's left to me you've taken the other three you've killed em one by one i don't say it wasn't justice i don't accuse none of you i don't say it was done without no court approving of what you done to em but i say for god's sake friends let me have this last one carney you've got a daughter stop this damned noise said carney loudly jarvis you're right something has been holding me back i don't know what there's a queer straight look about the eyes of this fellow that's not at all like the look of the other sherry's but of course it has been proved six times over this is charlie sherry and he hangs for it steve throw your rope over that branch will you we'll get the dirty business ended steve a leather-skinned and much wrinkled cowpuncher of middle age looked down upon his rope as though he pitied it the horrible duty which it was to perform then with the utmost dexterity he shot the noosed end over the designated branch jack bristol followed that movement with dull eyes his mind refused to understand he found himself noting more than the dangling rope the singing of a bird in the higher branches and the fragrance of the pines and the brightness of the sun as it fell brilliant but without warmth into the glade even the bustle of the cow-punchers closing in upon him conveyed no meaning to him but here hank sherry pressed in before him facing captain carney and as he came in jack felt a slight tug at the rope which bound his hands together he looked down in time to see the quick glint of a knife disappearing with open blade into the deep hip pocket of hank's trousers a deft backhand stroke had severed the rope in one place it only remained for jack to loosen and shake off the rest of the rope and he would be free but in order to escape he would have to gain the back of susan it seemed and since he had been dismounted only the moment before at the command of carney while steve was throwing the rope over the branch the difficulty was almost insuperable but the parting of the rope had roused an instant hope in him a slight turning of his wrist caused the entire length of the rope to loosen at any instant he could shake it off but in the meantime he flashed a glance over the others no hand was near a weapon they were rather intent upon the length of swinging rope and upon the plea of hank sherry for the strange old man had thrown himself upon his knees beside carney's horse and reaching up both of his grimy hands he was shrieking forth an appeal that they spare charlie my boy the last that's left to me here a hand fell rudely upon the shoulder of jack and he looked up into the face of lee jarvis over under the tree said jarvis fairly trembling with fierce satisfaction that's your place that fool's howling won't save you he thrust jack forward and the latter went without resistance and took his place where the noose of the rope touched against his cheek around him stood the horses of the posse in loose circle and beyond the horse behind the big tree from which the rope hung the mountainside rose at a sheer angle covered with a dense second growth in the meantime the voice of hank sherry had risen still louder say joe protested carney will you give me a hand to take the poor old devil away to his house and lock him up until this is over joe started his horse obediently forward it passed between jack and carney and at that instant jack shook the rope from his wrist and sprang away for safety there was no safe interval between the horses immediately in front of him instead of attempting to slide through he dived under steve's horse which stood with its side presented and while the latter whipped out his revolver with a startled yell jack rolled to his feet on the very edge of the dense forest of second-growth trees half a dozen guns exploded almost at the same instant behind him 
but there was only a pin-prick at his left shoulder and the next moment he had leaped behind the screen of leaves once there he ducked down and ran as close to the earth as possible not up the steep hillside but cutting across close to the edge of the clearing and that manoeuvre saved his life for the moment at least kearney and steve had sent their horses crashing up the mountain side through the saplings and with the aid of the others searched the ground before them with a steady fusillade of revolver bullets a headlong flight would have ended for jack in ten seconds but running to the side the noise of his feet on crackling twigs fully covered by the shouting of the posse the roar of guns the snorting of horses he skirted the clearing and came in this fashion to a point a hundred yards away there he looked out and saw lee jarvis gathering the reins of brown susan at least the big man knew a fine horse and had picked for himself the cream of the spoils of war the sharp whistle of jack brought susan forward with a bound the reins whipped out of the hands of jarvis and tugged him forward his toe struck a root and he toppled on his face while susan came flying she slackened her pace but did not stop for jack there was no need he sprang for the saddle clung with foot and hand like a cat and with a hail of lead whistling about him gained the back of the mare and twisted into temporary safety among the trees at the same instant he looked back as he flicked out of sight the riders were storming across the clearing at full speed had they shot from a stand they must have riddled him with bullets but they were following the lead of the old instinct which bids a man charge home and get to close quarters but they never sighted him in pistol shot again riding flattened to the back of susan letting her weave among the trees at her own will jack drew swiftly away until they came into an open natural lane among the trees and down this the mare fled with arrowy swiftness once again topping a bare shoulder of a mountain jack looked back and saw the others flogging their mounts ahead but the random volley which they raised fell short and jack turned in the saddle and waved a mocking farewell as he dipped out of sight again twelve he did not drive straight away from those unlucky mountains no culver valley and the worthy inhabitants thereof had by no means heard the last of jack bristol he allowed susan to travel on for less than an hour then he turned her to one side over a stretch of rock where she could not be trailed with any ease or speed unbridled her on a grassy meadowland and let her graze till noon without sighting any of the pursuers doubtless that first taste of the mare's running powers had convinced hard-headed kearney and the rest that a pursuit straight across the mountains would be worse than useless so they had winded and when the sun hung high at noon jack bridled the mare again and turned straight back on the trail from which he had come he wanted first to corner sherry and learn from that mysterious-minded fellow exactly what had been going on in his brain and after that there were certain duties which he wished to perform in culver valley for they had made him taste all the agony of death and against that heavy account he wished to pile up a balance he used little care during his approach to the sherry house he was reasonably sure that the disappointed posse would not wait patiently in the clearing they would not dream that he dared return so soon and they would go back to the valley to spread their unhappy tidings and warn the inhabitants along the culver river to beware of the vengeance which was impending it would be strange indeed if armed parties did not ride up and down the valley roads that night so he came back to the edge of the clearing and looked out from a gap in the trees there was no sign of hostile life only a column of smoke rose lazily from the chimney it was all so peaceful with the noonday sun pressing hot upon the clearing that it seemed impossible he had been a few seconds from death there that morning he cantered susan boldly to the door of the cabin and dismounted there stood hank sherry at the stove a sack tied around his hips by way of an apron frying meat the fragrance of which rolled heavily to the nostrils of hungry jack bristol the big mountaineer turned slowly juggling a fork idly in his hand after the fashion of a cook he nodded to jack without the slightest sign of surprise 
sit down he said chuck is about ready he pointed and jack saw that the table was equipped for two he shied his sombrero across the room sherry he said i ought to salt you away with lead but by god i ain't got the heart to pull a gun on you i ought to cut that lying tongue of yours out of your head and nail it in the sun to dry but the lies that tongue told this morning helped give me a chance to break away there's only one bargain i'm going to strike with you tell me what hellishness was in your mind at the start of all this will you do that and if i don't said the mountaineer scowling terribly upon him if you don't said jack calmly i'll stake you out on that clearing with your face turned up to the sun the other shrunk back i'm an old man he said i'm a pretty old man jack would you treat me like that has an old wolf got any call over a young wolf said jack he was astonished to see the other nod and actually smile as though he were pleased by the ultimatum which jack had delivered sit down and eat he said mildly have i been asking you a question said jack or maybe was it a chickadee singing on a stick the mountaineer laughed uproariously son he said you sure have a way with you well i'll tell you everything you want to know but sit down and eat first why said jack i'll hear you talk before i eat you won't said the other with an equal firmness because what i've got to say will be bad enough to hear on a full stomach but it's sure get me a fillin of lead if i talk to you hungry keep a bear's belly full and the bear ain't going to bother you none i've handled game before son it was impossible for some reason to stand up before the assurance of the trapper he stood with his hands resting on his hips squinting out at jack through his red shaded eyes with an expression of exhaustless evil will so jack bristol sat down and took his place in friendly fashion opposite sherry his fascinated eyes never leaving the white cross in the forehead of the mountaineer never ceasing to remember that the same brand was in his own flesh and even against his will and against his conscious mind it constituted a strong bond between them not that he for an instant relaxed his guard no every instant he was sternly on watch for some trickery on the part of the older man he sat in such a position that he could keep his eye upon the door at any moment some unknown ally of hank sherry he felt might break in upon him and yet under the attitude of sherry it was not violent hatred which he sensed it was rather a profound determination to show a better side to him the friendliness of the mountaineer surrounded him sherry said jack suddenly what do you expect me to do i got no expectations answered hank calmly what do you mean by that i mean i don't know which way you're going to jump you may go at my throat or again you may sit there real sensible and eat what i'm cooking for you i don't know which you'll do in spite of himself jack felt a smile beginning somewhere in him only in waves now and again he recalled the old hatred of his former jailer but the manner of sherry seemed to banish all that had happened into the unimportant past again he told himself that he could not harm a man so much older than he and also he assured himself that to take revenge upon hank sherry now would be like taking revenge upon a wild beast for acting as nature teaches it to act opposed to this was a faint but growing suspicion that sherry was less beast and more man than he had suspected all the time he had been there hank he said at last tell me what's been in your head and what you got planned for me now the mountaineer shrugged his shoulders what i got planned for you he queried you knew what would happen to me when i left what is your plan if i was to tell you the whole of it said hank sherry it would be a lot better if i could show you what i was talking about suppose we climb up yonder and get a peek at the whole of culver valley jack bristol nodded and followed up the mountainside he was more and more profoundly amazed by the manner in which sherry dominated him he had every reason to wish to destroy the mountaineer he had been tortured and branded and his very identity changed by this strange and terrible old man but behold he had just risen from the same table with hank sherry and now walked up the mountainside meekly submissive to the will of his leader while he turned these thoughts in his head they struggled up the mountainside until they reached the crest 
the climb had been as steep as a ladder and they had risen to the bald summit above timberline unobstructed by trees the vision swept clear before them over a host of lower peaks and yonder said hank sherry pointing is culver valley it was spread out neatly before them the distance compacted it like a map so that the eye caught every feature at a single glance and the marvellous clearness of the mountain air kept every detail clear culver valley was funnel-shaped running out from between loftier mountains near at hand and extending toward lower and lower hills as it grew wider until its mouth was lost in the horizon mist far away and in the centre they saw the bright streak of the culver river twisting out toward the plains beyond there it is said hank sherry there she lies old culver valley jack looking at his guide in surprise at the emotion in his voice saw hank sherry raise his hand and pass it slowly across his forehead as though to shield his eyes from what they saw or to erase some torturing memory from his mind it's the first time in all these years said hank it's the first time that i've ever looked at culver valley but there ain't been a day that i ain't thought about it i've stayed down yonder in that cabin and told myself that i'd forget all about everything i'd lost but it's a pile harder to do things than it is to say em every time i've looked up here at the top of this mountain i knew damn well what the mountain was seeing and it was like a mirror to me i looked to the mountain and the mountain showed me clear as glass all that i'd lost all that they'd robbed me of and it ain't changed it's just exactly the way that i expected it to be there's bleak mountain standing north my god i've seen bleak mountain on better days than this i've seen him wrapped up in rain fog on the day that my first boy was born i've seen every tree on his sides on the clear morning that i was married yes sir there's old bleak mountain lord god son it's a queer thing how we're all tied up with the things that we've seen i've looked at bleak mountain so often that it seems to me that bleak mountain must have eyes to look back at me i've been happy and blue so many times when i rode under the shadow of bleak mountain that damned if i ain't got to feel that the mountain was happy and blue just the same as me he paused and shook his head while jack bristol looked upon him with a deeper amazement than ever a peculiar gentleness had come over the voice and the eye of the veteran in this moment he lost in grimness he gained in kindly dignity damn their rotten souls snarled hank sherry i'll see em all in hell one of these days if only i could help to put em there the kindliness was gone in a flash there was nothing but black malice in all his nature but he added after an instant and there culver mountains running south and there's the old culver river in the middle why son it brings me jump into the middle of the days when i was a youngster younger than you spry as a linnet full of hell-fire and happiness he stretched out his long heavy arms and then let them fall to his side that's finished he said well he added turning to jack with another alteration of expression i ain't brought you up here to talk about scenery i come up here to talk to you about the kind of folks that live down yonder in that valley he paused might it be he said as he began to speak again that when you were down yonder they told you something about me and my boys and how we come to be marked i heard that all from lee jarvis said jack jarvis and it was his father that done the suggesting it was his father that led the way and the rest of em followed well i know what they told you about the burning of the minister's house and how they found out that my brother oscar was the thief and how they decided to mark the sherries and get rid of em and how many years they'd stood for what the sherries had done in culver valley they told you all that they did admitted jack and he looked curiously at the big man wondering what counterclaim he could put up to justify his blood when i begun to grow up said hank sherry it wasn't hard for me to tell that other folks wasn't particular fond of me if it happened that there was any whispering or noise-making or foolishness in school the teacher didn't hesitate more'n a minute she come straight down to my seat and yanked me up and licked me for what i'd never done same way through all the rest of the town if anything went wrong they came looking for me or for brother oscar well son you can't keep tar around all the time without getting dirty now and then 
when i begun to get a little bit older and big enough to think for myself i says as long as they think i'm bad why not be bad as long as they figure me to be a sneak and a thief and no good why not get the fun of doing the things that they think i'm doing he paused again and walked a pace up and down the brow of the mountain, and still Jack stared at him with an immense curiosity. It seemed perfectly incredible that any moral considerations had ever influenced the brain beneath that slant and brutal forehead. Well, went on the mountaineer, I begun to do what they expected of me. My brother Oscar had started long before, and he showed me the way. For a couple of years I raised hell in one way or another, pretty steady, but then I got a shock. I met up with a girl that had come new to the town with a pair of big black eyes and a smile that stopped you up like a jerk on a Spanish pit and a laugh that kept echoing inside of you. Ever meet up with a girl like that? Yes, said Jack Bristol, and the picture of Nell Carney rose in his mind and took the place of the portrait which Sherry had drawn. I met that girl, went on Sherry, and she knocked me loose from my old way of living. I didn't see nothing but her. She filled up the whole sky for me. I went to sleep thinking about her. I woke up dreaming about her. And I went hunting her, you might say. Well, she was new to the town. She hadn't hardly had a chance to learn the truth about me. And because she seen so much of me to begin with, she got to sort of liking me. Then along comes young Jarvis. That's the father of the Lee Jarvis that you know. He was the richest man in Culver Valley and when he seen my girl he sure lost his head because all the jarvis men go wild when they see a pretty face and the first thing that skunk done was to go sneaking to her and tell her all about what the sherry family stood for in culver valley he ground his teeth as he remembered it made her sick to listen to him but the first thing she done after hearing was to come straight to me and tell me everything and out of her telling me what she'd heard, and out of me admitting part of it, and what not, the short of it was that we got married the same day, me because I loved the ground she walked on, and her because she thought she could save me from being what all my family had been before me. And she did save me, partner. We had four sons. I kept her comfortable and happy. I built a house. I got it fixed up. When I hired out to work, I done more'n any two men and when she died i just kept right on because every one of them four boys had something of her in em one had her happy way of talking and laughing all together and another of em had the ways of her head and hand and charlie had her eyes he had her eyes exactly here he paused again and once more made a turn up and down on the brow of the mountain while jack bristol pitied him with all his heart the boys growed up said hank sherry and they got what i got before them they got what everybody by the name of sherry is always sure to get in culver valley they was suspected when they did nothing they couldn't go out and play in the street without having grown folks come out and keep an eye on em and when the boys got a bit old it riled em bad to see the way they got treated but i kept a stiff rein on em i kept em straight do you see i worked like hell myself i kept em working too they learned their lessons in school, they done their work, they didn't bother other folks, but still, in spite of that, nobody trusted them. Because there was the long years the Sherrys had always been bad, and there was my brother Oscar right then spending most of his time in jail. Then along come the time when the minister's house was burned. God knows I didn't have no hand in the burning of that house. That minister sure had the mercy of God in him. He was one man in town that believed in me. He was the one man in the whole of Culver Valley that would come and sit down with me and wish me luck. When I heard the fire alarm, I went and I worked with the first of em. It was me that stood first in the bucket line until the heat of the fire peels the skin off of my face, and then when I went off near fainting, I was so plumb done up, the roof crashed in and I heard him say that the whole family was wiped out. It was as though one of my own boys had been killed in that fire. I went home all sick inside and then they come and got us out of bed all of us and me with the bandages still on my face where the fire had burned me they got us out and they told us they'd hanged oscar for the minister's death and then they lined up the boys and heated a poker red white hot he stopped again and tore his shirt open at the throat jack himself felt as though he were half stifled 
they took my biggest son first they held him down and while he screamed they sent the iron smoking on his forehead and it was jarvis who held the poker oh god am i ever going to forget that he cast up his great arms as though with a blasphemous defiance against the heavens then they heated the poker again and they got the other three boys one after another last of all they come to charlie he was only a little shaver then i got down on my knees to them and begged but charvis damned me and branded little charlie with the rest and then they come to me but i didn't feel the iron there was too much pain on the inside of me to feel a thing like that i saw the smoke of my own flesh roll in front of my eyes that was about all and then i looked at my boys and i knew that their lives were ruined his voice changed i still had a hope i thought that i could make my boys grow up honest and straight what was a mark in the skin after all nothing terrible bad nothing that couldn't be lived down i hope so i took em up here in the mountains and we built a house and lived by ourselves and trapped and hunted and got along pretty fine and then one day a hunting party come up from the culver valley and they come upon one of my boys in the hills there was a pretty girl riding out ahead when she seen the mark on his forehead she lets out a scream and the rest of em come gallopin up they seen the mark on his forehead too they didn't ask no questions they took it for granted that he tried to harm her and they tied him to a tree and quirted him till the blood ran down his back he came back home that night my two oldest boys sat down with him and they swore that they'd be even with the rest of the world for what had been done to em i begged em not to try to fight odds of a million to one but they went ahead anyway and one by one i lost em only charlie remained he was the best of the lot and i thought that he'd get to be a fine man and then you come and he sees that mare and wants her more'n anything else on the earth and the end of it was that he starts in to finish you mind you it wasn't that he was bad by nature but every time he seen himself in the mirror he said to himself that he was damned anyway no matter what he done he couldn't come to no good end and so when he sees your hoss he says to himself why not so he went in and you know the end of charlie not that i blamed you but i said to myself if they put a mark on me and my boys and a curse on us along with the mark why can't i pass the curse along to one of them and see what happens and that's why i done what i done it was a terrible bad thing to do son i ain't denying that but i seen for myself that you were a tiger at fighting and the thought of turning a tiger loose in culver valley sure warmed the innards of me so i put the mark on you and there's the end of the story he extended his right arm look down there that's why i brought you up here when culver come here there was a sherry with him they split this valley in two and each took half along come the jarvis folks they cheated culver out of his share and now they've drove me out and i'm the last sherry end of chapter twelve Chapters thirteen and fourteen of the Cross Brand by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirteen. It was a singular story, Jack decided, because it left all of the truly important things unsaid. It gave all of the causes and hinted only in a general way at the effect. It was said that he hoped to loose upon peaceful Culver Valley a tiger in the person of Jack Bristol to that end he had stamped jack with the indelible identity of a sherry but how could he be sure that jack would accept the role which was prepared for him of that there was no doubt because no matter where he went he would be followed sooner or later by the news that he was a sherry and then he must return if he cared at all for human sympathy human converse to the one soul in the world who understood that he was free from blame but though the mountaineer left these things unsaid they were patent and clear to jack suddenly he put the question bluntly to his companion but suppose sherry he said that i light out on susan and strike out a straight line until i get a thousand miles from here where does your plan go then the other merely smiled and shook his head as usual he failed to look into the face of jack 
but stared into the vague distance while he answered suppose a wolf said hank sherry never got hungry then it never would kill calves and colts huh i don't foller you said jack well they've rounded you up ain't they said the mountaineer they've had a rope around your neck so to speak ain't they they've showed you what the culver vigilantes are ain't they ain't they talked to you about the culver vigilantes that never yet failed to get a gent that they started after and after they've pretty nigh hanged you do you mean to say that you could go away without getting back at em and suppose that i do said jack lee jarvis i sure owe a grudge to but after i get even with him what's to keep me from leaving the valley and going on my way why said the other after you've started the game maybe you'll find that it's too much fun to quit playing but here's a chance for you to write all the lay of the land down in your head if you was to go down into that valley son you'd have it alive and buzzing like a nest full of bees in a minute or two son they've got their telephones strung out everywhere they shoot out of their alarms in a flock and they've got their damned vigilantes always ready to jump on the fast hosses with their guns and start out on a manhunt they got a boast in culver valley that they don't need no sheriff they take care of their own affairs his voice broke to a half snarl half groan like they took care of me and my boys so if you got a mind to take a crack at em write all the roads and all the lay of the land in your brain jack there was no need to give that advice jack bristol had already memorized every detail which could be seen in such a general survey he was still continuing that mental survey as he returned down the hill with hank sherry it was true as sherry had said the temptation would be great and the more he heard of the difficulty of the work the more determined he was that culver valley had not yet heard the last of him to be found in it again of course would mean instant death at the hands of whoever discovered him to take that chance by entering the valley meant that he might have to shoot to kill in his own defence but in spite of all dangers there was still a luring bait in the trap somewhere yonder in the valley was yes he had been able to pick out the very site of the carney house was nell filled with horror to this moment by the thought that she had ridden alone through the night at the side of a sherry all that remained of that afternoon jack spent in grooming brown susan and oiling a brace of revolvers and a rifle to be carried in a long holster under his knees when he rode hank sherry paid not the slightest attention to him but devoted himself to a continuation of his morning's labor of wood chopping his axe rang merrily and steadily until late afternoon with the sun just dropped behind the western mountains and then it was that jack bristol set forth on his raid he had only a vague purpose on the one hand he must see nell kearney and strive to convince her before he left that there was no stain in his blood then having said farewell to her forever he must find out lee jarvis whose cruel cunning had brought him to the verge of death find some means of striking at him a blow the rich man's son would never forget and then ride on out of culver valley forever as for the expectation of hank sherry that he could never disentangle himself from the pursuit of the culver vigilantes he shrugged his shoulders at that evil prophecy only in one respect had the mountaineer been right and that was when he called the whole affair a game a game it was a truly wonderful game of chance no game of cards was ever half so enthralling for the stakes at cards could never run as high as life and death he had played many a time for all his worldly possessions but all of those former games were dull and stupid compared with this and as he went down the mountain pass into the upper levels of the culver valley with the culver river streaked down the centre in a current of tarnished silver under the moon a new happiness filled him for there is no joy so keen as the joy of the fighter before he goes into battle the ragged twinkling of lights in the lands below told him of so many homes and in every home armed men ready to combat him for he was the universal enemy yes by the very fact that all hands were raised against him there was a suggestion that he possessed strength enough to combat them all 
now brown susan dropped into the smoother roads of the lowlands and the joyous rhythm of her gallop carried jack on while the mountains rolled back farther and farther on either side bleak mountain to the north and culver mountain on the south rolling lines of summits dimly visible in the moonlight hoofbeats drummed before him bobbing silhouettes of horsemen flocked on the road before him but jack bristol kept straight on sitting at an alert balance in the saddle ready to flee ready to fight but by moonlight who could recognize him the riders swept closer dissolving from shadows into the distinct outlines of cowpunchers with wide brims curling in the wind of their galloping shouting to one another as they tore down the road they had come in from some ranch among the hills they were starting for a time and speed was the best part of it all they went by jack with a chorus of whoops and he answered them with shouts full as cheery what would go through their brains if someone should tell them that they had just whipped past charlie sherry that thought set jack laughing to himself as he went on he overtook a buckboard with a pair of down-headed horses jogging slowly out the road the driver called to him he called joyously back to the driver after all these were not a peculiarly evil people they simply saw in him a sherry and in the sherries they saw a clan who had brought destruction and terror to the culver valley if he were among them he would have shared all of their prejudices that he knew and the result was that half of the venom was taken from his thoughts before he turned to the side and came down the lane which led to the house of captain carney if he could only ride into town give himself up and demand that they send to the south for means of establishing his identity if he could only do that how pleasant it would then be with scarred or unscarred forehead to settle down and live the rest of his days in beautiful culver valley but if they sent to the south they would establish his identity so he thought as the slayer of sheriff harry ganton therefore there was nothing to do but see the girl for the last time and then flee somewhere farther to the north there might be safety for him somewhere far in the north and east in a cold country a shiver went through him at the thought he found that the carney house was lighted only in a front room and that not brilliantly telephone lines had been established in culver valley but there was not enough power to wire the houses with electricity therefore the windows were soft with yellow lamplight he left susan in the center of a small group of trees near the house and slipped up to observe what went on within that lighted room what he found was nell carney talking seriously with no less a personage than big lee jarvis fourteen it was easy to see them and to hear the shades were undrawn he had only to ensconce himself at the side of the window opening upon the veranda in front of the house in order to both hear and see all that went on and he eavesdropped shamelessly cruelty and bad luck had given him terrible handicaps in the matter of this girl he felt that he could justifiably adopt somewhat shady methods in return and of course everything came out jarvis was saying the governor heard from a dozen sources about what had happened to me and my adventure with the sherry blackguard i waited in fear and trembling now upon my word i thought that the old boy would descend upon me with lightning and thunder because he was sure to guess that i was out to see you that night he laughed at the thoughts of his own fears but while his head was raised jack noted that a faint sneer shadowed the lips of the girl for an instant and then disappeared but still it seemed to jack that she continued to observe her companion with a hawk-like fixity you can imagine how i felt ran on jarvis when the old boy came in to see me and blurted out at once that he'd changed his mind anything i wanted as badly as i apparently wanted you he thought would be all right and marry you i should and so nell in five minutes everything was arranged can you believe it just when i thought that disaster had come along the skies cleared and the sun shone on me and next week my dear we'll be married eh? he sprang from his chair as he spoke and went to her jack bristol looked down in sudden agony good gad nell 
he heard lee jarvis exclaim and looking up again he saw that she had not stirred from her chair but one partially lifted hand had stopped jarvis in mid-stride what's up gasped the big man you look cold as ice nell confound me if you don't i'm sorry said the girl i don't intend that only well i don't know what it was said the girl but when you came toward me like that i felt almost as if someone were watching us she smiled faintly lee jarvis with an exclamation of annoyance stepped closer to her and looking up to him she shrank back in what was almost absolute fear now what in the world has come over you you look at me as though i were a stranger you've acted like this ever since last night is it something i've done have i offended you don't be so infernally secretive try as i may i never feel that i know more in the outer rim of your real nature i'm sorry answered the girl her voice falling to such a pitch that jack could barely make out what she said i'm very sorry but when you came toward me like that well lee i simply couldn't have endured it if you had taken me in your arms he bit his lip i know you've never liked that sort of thing he said but good heavens nell do you expect me to be a sort of old woman's companion and sit about and talk books and what not i suppose that would be ridiculous of course said the girl with acid sarcasm that made jarvis crimson but she added at once in a kindlier tone lee we've always been more or less chums until your father sent you away to school i missed you terribly when you were away when you came back we were both so glad to see one another that don't you think we may have thought it was love and after all there was not a bit of true love in our affection his face was spotted with gray and purple so sudden was the shock to him one eye was now covered with a black patch the other was discolored and squinting for the instant his expression was one of devilish malevolence then he turned on his heel and walked up and down the room for a turn or two without saying a word and jack could see that pride was battling in him and bidding him make no concession to her coldness but his courage was not equal to his pride he crumbled suddenly and turning toward her cast out his hands good god nell are you going to break things up the girl rose in turn and quickly as though she had not realized until he spoke how very serious her last suggestion had been i don't know what i've been saying lee she said i i haven't meant to hurt you but but i oh of course i don't mean to break off anything unless you wish i've given you my word lee and my word is sacred you surely know that lee jarvis struggled with words that would not come words which jack bristol knew should have assured her that he would never dream of holding her to her promise against her will then on the gravel of the roadbed there was a scattering of gravel and a horseman drew rein jack pressed closer to the side of the house trusting to the shadow to conceal him the stranger dismounted and came up the front door it's father said lee jarvis with an air of immense relief he lowered his voice and said something which jack could not hear then he opened the door and a man as tall as young jarvis and of the same cast of countenance entered it was the same face but grown older the square outline was more pronounced the jaw more square and at its base little ridges of muscle leaped out when he set his teeth the cheekbones were high and made prominent by a spot of color upon them the eyes were deep-set and extremely steady in their gaze the whole frame of the man was big well-filled athletic he bore his later middle age resolutely and lightly one would expect him to ride or walk as far as any agile youth an indomitable will was stamped upon him his step his incisive manner of speech his gestures his reserve were all typical of one sort of very strong man withal he was a handsome man he stepped into the room smiling and nodding to the girl he shook hands with her and kept her hand in his for an instant it seemed to jack that he was examining her as something which was about to pass into the possession of his family perhaps the girl felt the same thing and it was this which made her flush and everything is settled and a date arranged he suggested 
young jarvis stared at his fiancée in a very horror of alarm but she answered his father with a smile of perfect assurance next month is my lucky month you see and so we've decided to put it off at least as long as that very good said the father but there was a shadow on his face as he spoke i am not one who favors sudden action at any time other than a crisis i'm about to go back to town just now because we have just passed through a trifling crisis they murmured polite questions yes said the elder jarvis his eyes sparkling someone let it out that there is a heavy deposit in cash at the dexter bank and this evening there was an attempt to blow the door of the safe a chorus of exclamation stopped him i was walking down the street after dark said the rich man of the culver valley and i caught a glint of light in the bank it seemed odd to me so i slipped across the street opened the door with a pass key and to make a long story short i bagged my man in the middle of his work with his soup and soap laid out and only a few minutes work left to him it you fought him asked the son it was a short fight i knocked the rascal senseless and then tied his hands when i got him out to a good light i recognized him as young frank stroud from beggar to robber seems to be only a step young frank stroud echoed the girl poor fellow the elder man turned sharply upon her i presume that you have in mind he said the story that i ground frank's father between an upper and nether millstone and ground the life out of him in the end is that what's in your head my dear let me tell you the truth i found frank stroud senior a rich but very foolish man his business methods were slipshod i often warned him against them but he saw fit to go on his way disregarding my warnings and the result was that when the crash came and i was in a position to clean him out i did exactly that i made him an example which will teach young men starting in business not to disregard advice he stamped lightly as he spoke and set his teeth at the end of his speech so that hollows formed in his cheeks and a little wedge of muscle stood out at the base of his jaw that's the story of frank stroud in brief and now his son proves what the family is made of the young wretch has turned into a professional safe-cracker well he is lodged in the very front of the jail now and he can look through the bars at the bank which he tried to rob the young fool begged like a dog to be let off i laughed at him and he laughed heartily while jack bristol saw a flash of horror spread across the girl's face but will you ride back with me suggested the father to the son i'll give you a look at young stroud i like that grinned lee jarvis he turned away in his excitement almost forgetful of nell she came to the door and watched them hurry out to their horses and then the gravel was scattered in a flurry of hoofs as the two rushed away on the road for the town of dexter and wretched frank stroud that noise of hoofs died out in the distance was heard again as the face of a hill caught the passing sound and flung it back and then the blessing of silence spread once more over the culver valley a silence so complete that when the girl sighed as she stood at the door it seemed to jack that the sound was at his very ear End of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen and Sixteen of the Cross Brand by Max Brand. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fifteen. Yes, said Jack aloud. I'd call it hard talk. She gasped. The air swished around the door as she jerked it close, but it did not slam. Instead, she checked it and opened it again. Who is there? She asked in a voice husky with fear somebody said jack who's on the outside of the house and you're on the inside with fighting men ready to come out on the jump the minute you call for em are you afraid afraid who are you think back said jack ah cried the girl it can't be you you haven't dared come again do you think it's as big a risk as that lady the door clicked but it left her on the outside she came straight down the veranda to him don't you know that the vigilantes are watching for you don't you know that if they catch you there'll be no mercy jack bristol laughed i know all that he said but it's worth the chance worth it why not 
it's worth a lot to hear you warning me of the danger it means that i've got a friend in culver valley i pity you with all my soul lady said jack calmly i sure got to differ with you on that maybe you think it's pity but it ain't there was an instant's pause no asked the girl then what is it that makes me warn you shame said jack you're plumb ashamed of the way you yelled out and started them after me the other night yes admitted the girl after a moment perhaps that's it they said that you came within a hair's breadth of being yep they had the rope hanging for me if that had happened i should have despised myself forever why asked jack why because you had done me no harm ain't there another reason of what sort lady you knew that i wasn't charlie sherry what i say you knew that i wasn't charlie sherry when we rode through the dark talking you knew that i was tolerable honest is that true again she paused and finally she said they told me how you denied the poor old man when he claimed you for his son are you ashamed of your own father and mother charlie sherry my father and mother never carried that name but call me charlie sherry if you want that makes no difference i'm glad you confess your name i confess nothing said jack bristol but no matter what you say there's something on the inside of you that tells you i'm not a sherry you wouldn't be talking to me here otherwise there's a sort of a sense in a girl that tells her when there's danger and you know that there's a pile less now than there was when you were talking to lee jarvis say inside of your own home you've listened to us you overheard us again it's a right i have a right you've double-crossed me and kept me out of a fair chance i can't come by daylight so i come by dark is there anything wrong in that suppose i hadn't come i'd never have seen you turn your back on jarvis do you think i turned my back on him you have sharp eyes said the girl curiously but i'm afraid they see more than the truth lady said jack when a gent takes a long chance on getting his neck stretched for the sake of seeing a girl he most generally uses his eyes hard when he gets his look at her i wasn't sitting here looking through the window at your face i was looking right on through your mind and everything that went on inside you she started but she came a little closer toward him you're the strangest of all the strange men i've ever known she said that's because i'm telling the truth to you and i think you strange for that reason sure i know the way men talk to girls they act like the truth about things would be too much for a girl to understand so they tell her just a little part of it and dress the rest up in lies i know because i've done it myself she began to laugh very softly charlie sherry she said i have to tell you to go away and never come back for the sake of your own safety but when you go i shall think of you a thousand times i promise you that you haven't been out of my head since i first met you last night and you began jack ardently hush said the girl i can guess that you were about to say something foolish isn't that true whenever a gent lets go all holes and tells the truth about himself and the way he feels why do people say he makes a fool of himself lady i'm not ashamed i came down here to see you once more you stayed in my mind like a picture i'd drawed myself ten times every hour i've been seeing the scratch and the spurt of that match jarvis lighted and then your face jumping out of the darkness sort of scared and happy all at once i came down here to see you once more but now that i've seen you and heard you i know this isn't the last time i'm coming again no cried the girl if they caught you jack bristol laughed it's the greatest game in the world i wouldn't miss a trick of it there's only one thing in the world that's worth it and that's nell Carney. but she's worth a thousand times more charlie sherry cried the girl and the name brought him up sharply i shall never see you again not if it means bringing you into such danger why he broke in upon her if i know that you care so much there's nothing that'll keep me away 
but i understand she exclaimed in a different tone it's only taking the chance that brings you here it's the gambling spirit just as it was the gambling spirit that made frank stroud try to break into the bank and steal and when jarvis was telling about it said jack which did you like the most was it the thief or the rich man you have an uncanny way of looking into one's motives said the girl and perhaps you're right i remember poor frank stroud his father was very well to do and frank was a happy careless youngster when mr jarvis crushed his father frank was able to do nothing but stay around and go to dances and then his money gave out and he disappeared and here he is back and ruined for life has he done any worse said jack than jarvis when jarvis smashed him jarvis stayed inside the law nell called the voice of her father from within the house oh nell coming she answered charlie sherry are you going to stick to that name then i'll do what you expect charlie sherry to do i'll go down the valley for your sake and i'll let frank stroud out of jail would that make you happy nell carney you madman you would be taken also it wouldn't help frank i say would it make you happy to see frank free happy as a lark but if you go nell called the father and his footfall began to come down the stairs in the house if i set him free you'll see me again asked jack yes yes i, I mean no oh what shall i do and say say good-bye said jack for to-night and remember that lee jarvis will have the face of his father when he gets to that age good-night nell and remember sixteen he cast a circle around the little town of dexter slowly he sent the mare over the outskirts jumping the fences one by one sometimes riding a little way down one of the roads or lanes which focused in dexter and in short examining at his leisure all the approaches which were incidentally all the exits also and when that was done he swung brown susan around and cantered her straight down the main street along which all of the houses were grouped it was a rash thing to do when there were half a dozen men in the town who had actually seen him by the light of day and while every other grown and armed man was on the lookout for him but the very recklessness of it was his best safeguard on the lookout though they might be they would never dream of him actually galloping a horse through dexter under the assembled noses of the vigilantes so famous through culver valley at least he went down that main street without interruption even whisking through more than one bright shaft of light from window or open front door and as he went he took stock of the town there was no doubt about the location of the jail with its barred windows and the bank opposite a little further down the street he passed a stable full of livery horses then striking out onto the open roads beyond the town he quickly made a detour to the left and curved back behind dexter again for he had framed a plan evening is the front yard time in a village the entire population of the town was gathered along the main street gossiping and joking jack bristol coming in from behind found it comparatively easy to pick the most likely horse in the pasture behind the livery stable he left susan stalked and captured the horse and tethered it to the fence then he ventured closer slipped into the main stable itself and without difficulty secured a saddle and bridle so equipped he returned to the horse in the pasture saddled the animal and brought it out through a gate next uh, riding susan and leading the tough pinto of which he had made a prize he went down the length of the town until he came to a point opposite the flat roof of the jail here he tethered the pinto behind a tree left susan beside it and started in toward the jail itself but the moment he began his approach it seemed that the entire aspect of the town had changed all the life had hitherto seemed concentrated solely along the main street 
but now it appeared that the silence along the backs of the houses was merely a symbol that the houses were filled with watching and waiting men ready to attack him when he drew closer that illusion passed in a moment a man began to sing in the yard at the back of the jail he disappeared inside banging a screen door which jingled behind him while his song trailed away into the interior even a jail seemed to possess cheerful and homely attributes in culver's valley jack paused in the rear of a convenient tree to make his last preparations even as he stood there an inner door behind the screen door at the rear of the jail was closed with a heavy jar it was a steel door barred above solid steel below as he could see the screen door on the outside was simply to keep out flies and mosquitoes seen dimly behind this door the jail was a dimly lighted room entangled with a maze of steel jack sauntered around to the corner of the building and leaning there rolled a cigarette he did not light it but the rolling gave him excuse to loiter while he scanned the front of the building narrowly and the street nearby down that street half a dozen young men just past boyhood were frolicking not a full fifty yards away they possessed manpower enough to crush him and his attempt if they caught an alarm in time the rest of the street was vacant this section the bank on one side and the jail on the other might be called the downtown district in dexter and at this hour people were at their homes as for the jail itself the cell of frank stroud could be easily located through the description which had been given by the elder jarvis there were three windows looking out upon the street but two of these were large ample for the admission of sun and air the third alone was narrow and tall though all three were heavily criss-crossed with bars but only that narrow one could open upon a cell the others must open upon a central hall or the office of the jail-keeper the observations of jack completed in this fashion he took out from his pocket a section of black lining cut out of his coat on the ride into dexter from the carney house this he tied around the top of his head having first sliced it across the front for eye holes he rolled the mask on the top of his head settled his hat in place and then stepped briskly to the door of the jail a pair of young fellows strolled past as he waited and when they paused his heart jumped how small a thing was required to thrill the nerves when one defied the law they went on again almost at once and in the meantime steps approached the door from the inside jack twitched the mask down from the inside of his hat as the door swung open he jabbed his revolver into the stomach of a corpulent gentleman who stood gasping before him make this quick suggested jack and slipping inside he closed the jail door behind him so doing he shut out from the street the picture of the fat jail-keeper standing with his arms thrust up above his head he dropped the revolver back to his side ah, get your hands down the other obeyed every cell in the jail was simply an open work of bars the gleam of that gun might catch the eye of the half-dozen prisoners who lounged here and there in their cells for the dexter jail was the depository of criminals for all of the culver valley there might be a riot in a moment if they suspected that there was a jail delivery taking place out of which they themselves obtained no advantage go back to your office warned jack sternly but softly mind you walk brisk and don't try to queer emotions with your hands i'm watching you every minute step lively old son i'm right behind you the fat man opened the door and led the way into an office at a table in which sat a wide-shouldered youth leaning over an open ledger and about this mcguire this g mcguire that you've got wrote down here dad he inquired get me a pair of handcuffs said jack the words brought the other bounding out of his chair he was reaching for his gun as he landed on his feet and then he caught the glint of jack's leveled weapon for an instant their eyes clashed then his hands came away and rose slowly above his head 
that's good said jack that's mighty good we pretty near had an accident happening partner get those handcuffs dad the jailer found them without a word jack brought the arms of the youth behind him and snapped the steel manacles over his wrists listen he said i'm not going to gag you but if i hear a whisper out of you i'm going to come back here and feed you lead understand the other flinched and jack turning to the father gestured to him to lead the way we got the jail all peaceful now he said just take your keys along we'll have frank stroud out of his jail old son just make that pronto too a wave of the gun made the jailkeeper start ahead with a grunt of haste his heels struck heavily on the concrete flooring outside and that sound caused two or three heads to lift and turn toward them from the cots of the prisoners then they rose to their feet the word passed in five seconds every man in the jail was standing erect they had not seen the revolver for jack now carried it in the pocket of his coat but they knew that something was decidedly wrong the air was filled with the scent of adventure straight to the door of the cell farthest to the left went the jailer inside there was standing at the bars a big blond man in the very prime of his late twenties his big hands were gripping the steel rods before him in the lock of his door the key turned the jailer stepped back step easy take your time jack cautioned the prisoner come out here into the aisle beside me what queried the prisoner go slow began jack but as the door swung open he sensed danger at his side and turned in time to see the fat man reaching for a gun indeed the steel of the barrel was already glittering as he drew it forth it needed only the touch of his trigger finger to wipe the fat man from his path but instead he drove his left fist into the pit of the jailer's stomach he fell gasping and wriggling jack picked the revolver out of his hand and gave it to frank stroud who now stood excited beside him that fall had proven to the other prisoners that it was a jailbreak that they were witnessing and a chorus of low voices began calling you know me stroud give me a word to your pal kit listen to me i can make you rich i've got a turn that'll fix you for life hey black mask for god's sake don't leave me here in the hole when let's let them out exclaimed stroud the more of us the better let out nothing commanded jack i'm letting out one man and i've got one horse for him now sprint for that back door i think there's only a latch holding it stroud waited for no more he lit out at full speed with jack at his heels and as they ran the low calls of the other prisoners changed to yells and imprecations of rage as they realized that they were not to be saved yonder on the floor lay the precious glimmering bundle of keys which had fallen from the hand of the jailer it had only to be picked up and tossed to one of them and instead of that the two were fleeing to a selfish liberty the yell of the prisoners fairly split the roof of the jail and when jack and frank stroud threw open the rear doors of the building the sound rolled loudly out with them while the fat jailer sitting up on the floor began firing blindly in the general direction in which the pair had disappeared End of chapter sixteen